Once again, I imagine if you were watching this, you have either played Fear and Hunger 1 and 2, or you realize the game was just too hard and you just want to see the endings. Which I get, but you have to realize I'm going to pull no punches and there's going to be spoilers. So, there's your warning. However, unlike the first game, we do not know which one of these three endings are canon, or if any of them are even canon, or if all of them are canon. We don't know. Fear and Hunger 2 is a game made by Finnish developer Miro Havernin. The game was fully released in December of 2022. The series didn't get really popular in English-speaking countries until 2023, when several YouTubers covered it. The first game follows four playable characters looking for a man named Lagarde. Eventually, the daughter of Lagarde becomes an ascended god. Lagarde himself lives somehow and establishes an empire known as the Bremen Empire, dubbing himself the Kaiser. Several hundred years later, a servant of the moon god, Perkel, is holding a festival in the moon god's name. Determine a festival, a festival in which 14 people must fight it out until only one is standing, all in the sacrifice to the moon god. That is all you need to know about the game to know about the endings, however you should have played the game yourself obviously, but if you understand that, or can't, here we go. Ending A. Ending A is the hardest one to get, but worth it if you want a quote unquote happy ending. It involves finding three telectroscopes in three different Bremen bunkers. An easy way to describe this ending is to keep following the blue moths in the game. The first one is in the first bunker you will probably find immediately. It's in the first building on the far left of the forest in the beginning area of the game right outside the train. This is the bunker where you will meet Needles and possibly Moonscorch Shabella if you, eat all my beans! you weren't fast enough to get here. Go to the bottom of the bunker by pouring in two gas cans and take the elevator down to the bottom of the bunker. Down here you will find a body with an eagle key and a weird machine. To turn on the machine it's as easy as pressing the on button. If you want to see what this machine really is, go into Rare's realm here and look again. A strange flesh machine that you just turned on. What is this strange living machine, you may ask yourself? Now you can leave the bunker. The second bunker is a little harder to get to. You need to go into the deep forest. There are two ways that I am aware to get here. The first of which is finding the skin Bible of Vanushka. Once you do, you can read this book and draw Vanushka's symbol in the summoning circle right outside the train. This will cause a tree to grow and you can climb onto it to get to the deep forest. The second way is a little longer, but it doesn't rely on RNG. You need to go all the way through the city and make your way south once you make it to the ruined west side of the city. You'll find another entrance into the deep forest here. From here you need to search around until you find a secret entrance into the even deeper forest. Be careful here though because the centaur is here just patrolling around. Despite me being a bona fide funger god that I am, I have never even attempted to fight this thing seriously. I really gotta do that sometime. But I digress. Keep going and following the blue moth. You'll find another bunker. Here you will find stitches. Kill her and find two more gas cans in this bunker as well, or you can just use any you find lying around. Then once again, go down the elevator and turn on the second telectroscope. Then once again, you can leave. Okay, now this is the really hard part. The third telectroscope is much, much, much harder. In fact, it is the second hardest thing to do in this ending. It doesn't help that the only somewhat competent tutorial on YouTube on how to get this is 40 minutes long. So I've taken this upon myself to explain it in brevity because no one else can, it seems. Okay, here we go. The third telectroscope involves solving the sewer puzzle to get it. The puzzle involves switching levers back and forth to turn on and off sewer pipes to get to the third bunker underneath the church. It doesn't help that the sewers in this game are almost as bad as the ones in Elden Ring. What is that? Bear ass. You want to start here at the manhole in the main part of the city, in between the bookstore save point and the Church of Almer. From here, you can go down to the sewer and head northeast. This will bring you to the sewer lever puzzle. Now, you want to set these levers to down, up, down, up. This won't make a ton of sense yet because you still won't be able to do anything here. However, if you go back up and then go down the sewer manhole near the white mold apartments, and then go as far east as you can, you are now able to access the sewer treatment plant from the other side with the levers you turned off. From here, go to the top of the plant and release the ladder. You can now once again access the control panel. This time, switch the levers to up, down, down, up. Now you can climb to the second level of the plant and enter the door. Go through, climb the ladder to, go through and climb the ladder to the top. From here, go right and push the blue box near this waterfall or uh, sewage fall. Then switch the switches once again to up, down, up, down. Then once again, climb the plant to the top, and then go push the blue box into the middle of the grate right in the line of the sewage fall. Go back down to the switches and just switch the fourth switch on and off real quick. This will turn the sewage fall on and off really quick and push the blue boxes into the water, allowing you to go through. That's the puzzle, and it's really annoying. 
You can pause and rewind if you need to. It's an annoying ass puzzle. Once you do all of that, climb down the ladder and follow the blue moths again. But be careful because there are rats down here that can do a fuck ton of damage. So avoid them as best as you can. Make your way to the bottom right of this room and then go into the next room and then go north to fight Moonless. She's a tough fight, but take out Black Steel. This will give you one of the best, if not the best, one-handed weapons in the game. Then blind her with glass. Then do what it is what you have to do. I would take out Miasma and then keep fighting her until August will stop the fight and give you some healing items. I'm honestly not sure what happens if August is already dead here, so someone can tell me that in the comments. Either way, finish the fight with Moonless and go into the bunker and turn on the third telectroscope. After that, go and head to the tower where the game is supposed to end. Once you're at the tower, do not go in. Instead, go west to the museum. Here, you will find the butler from the beginning of the game and he will tell you to find three people in this museum. They will tell you to set the clock in the middle of the museum to 135 or 1335, with the symbol for sulfur. It doesn't change throughout each playthrough, so it will always be this code. This door will open and you can climb down the world's longest ladder. Now you will be at the end of the line, the white bunker. This place is really hard to navigate through your first time, but since this boss is really hard, there's a good chance that, like me, you will learn this place like the back of your hand. In the first floor of the bunker, you can find a gas can if you need it, if you go straight north and avoid the flamethrower trooper who will insta-kill you if he hits you outside of battle, which has ruined several of my runs, so fuck this guy in particular. You can find the gas can to the left of him. Continue to the bottom left of this room. You can go to the second floor from here. If you need yet another gas can, you can find one to the north of this crow guy. Then at the top right of the second floor here, you can pour two gas cans into the generator. And then once again, go to the bottom left of this room. This will take you to the third floor of the bunker. Now listen up, because this is important. In this third room, there is a Sylvian trooper and a platoon. A disgusting monster which I assume is a marriage between a man and a tank? Some sort of Sylvian marriage because this is a Sylvian trooper, who by the way is in my favorite type of clothes. Makima is one of my favorite anime characters by the way, I'm not taking questions at this time. You need to catch up with this trooper and fight her before she gets to the end of this room. If she does, she will summon the platoon with 10,000 health. At every turn it has the chance to do a coin flip and insta kill you. Which I feel like I have the worst luck in the fucking world with this thing. I have died, no joke, 9 or 10 times to this thing. So the best case scenario is you need to catch up with the, the Sylvian Tripper and kill her in one single turn. Doing so will give you access to the next floor. Or you can fight the platoon and kill it, and that'll work too. I just don't advise it. This room will bring you once again to the Grand Hall of the New Gods. Then you will once again be pulled out and brought to a room, the Machine God's White Womb. But before you enter this door, the Kaiser will stop you. This fight is quite a bit harder than in the first game. In the first game, what could Lagarde do? Use an asterisk and piss on me and do 3 damage or something? Well, now he's got a sword and can cut off limbs, and his sword arm has quite a bit of health. So my suggestion is to take a blunt weapon and stun the arm. Or just have arm guards and a salmon snake rune. So take him out and continue. Here in the womb, Logic will fight you. She will have a main body with 6 tanks. Every once in a while, these tanks will activate and start an extremely strong attack. Every turn, she will cast Red Arc in some way or another. Either a single attack, a double attack, or one that hits everyone. This wouldn't be hard, except she has 20,000 HP and your, and your attacks seem to do half damage here. And on top of that, after 13 turns, she will mature into the real Machine God. This one has a woman on the throne and the Hand of Creation and Hand of Destruction. Once she goes into the space, she will heal 9,999 HP and start the fight once again. If you somehow make it here and aren't dead, and didn't kill her in 13 turns, take out the Hand of Destruction immediately. It has 4000 HP and can use Hurting, Black Orb, or Combustion. The Hand of Creation is useless and only heals like 200 HP per turn, which if you are here, it's less damage than one singular attack will do. The other problem with this phase is regardless if you kill the Hand of Destruction or not, she will cast Moth Swarm. The blue moths from earlier will come and hit you and do a bit of damage and heal logic the same amount of damage. After you somehow kill this annoyingly difficult boss, which I think is a contender for the hardest boss in the series by the way, she will open up and show you her real self. It's the girl in the pink dress that you've been following all game. If you're playing as Olivia, which I am here, she will say that this is her sister. The god will open up and absorb you and your party. This machine god is sort of like the third impact in Neon Genesis Evangelion. It completely absorbs you and everybody else. 
giving true world peace, sure, but the loss of all individuality. However, everyone not dead will circumvent the moon scorching and the Terminal Festival will be ended prematurely, making this the only ending where more than one person can survive. However, you and your party will not be escaping logic, and you will be absorbed. Ending B Ending B is a little easier to describe, and it was also the first ending I got. As we've discussed, there are 14 people in the Terminal Festival. This ending just has you complete your end of the bargain. You have to either kill the other 13 people, or you can have them killed, or do whatever it takes to be the last person standing. You need to do this only on day 3, or deny Perkla's offers if you do it sooner than day 3 morning. Perkla will congratulate you when you get to the top of the tower, and he will say that the moon god left this world long ago along with the other gods. So Perkle has stopped serving him. However, he has continued the festival in the name of the new god instead, the Sulphur God. He won't tell you much about the Sulphur God, so I suggest you watch my video on him on screen right here if you want to know more. But he will say he'll just let you go instead, as long as you can get through him. This ending's a little easier, however, it is the second hardest one to get in my opinion. Not because it's hard to get to the final boss, but because the final two bosses are decently hard to fight back to back. The first fight is Perkle. The strategy I have for him is to immediately take out his left wing, as in the right one on the screen. This wing can cast Feather Rain which is quite annoying, however the main problem with this wing is it will block everything else if you don't take it out. However, do not take out both arms whatever you do. If you do, he will cast Black Orb and Hurting instead, which is much more devastating than Lunar Storm or Feather Rain. His torso isn't too strong, having only 4500 HP, so it's smart to put a dot on his torso as soon as possible to take it out fast. Because if you don't know, dots and fear and hunger are stupid strong. So set him on fire or bleed him. After you take him out, he will be battered and beaten, and with his last breaths he will break the chain that he had on the moon gods, or the remnants of it. I'm not sure what this actually is symbolizing, so if anyone knows, put that in the comment. And with that, the traces of Rare will come to fight you. Rare is much more annoying than Perkle. He has several eyes that will constantly drain your mind, making magic almost impossible, and if you're at zero mind, he will also do a coin flip attack that will instantly kill you. So do what you need to do fast before your mind gets sapped. You can also summon a dreamscape that can either stab you or cut off a limb, which is super annoying. You can also moon scorch you, which will not turn you into a monster, but will instead set you on fire, which as we discussed is a big deal in Fear and Hunger. It also doesn't help that if you get a limb cut off when you have a two-handed weapon, your run is pretty much over if you don't have arm guards, the fluted armor, or the salmon snake rune. Now you might think this is not too bad, but if you don't read between the lines earlier, you have to fight these two bosses alone. You can have a non-controllable party members like Ghouls, Blood Golems, or Black Caleb, but it's really annoying to pretty much have one effective way of damaging the enemy and three meat shields. Once Rare gets bored of you or whatever, he will return to space or wherever he goes to, and you will wake up on the fourth day. You are alive, and your mind's been injected with eldritch knowledge, but somehow you're more or less sane. Sure, you have probably killed a bunch of innocent people, but you've come out on top. You take the train to wherever you heart, your heart desires now. It's a new day. Depending on who you were playing, this ending will get a small excerpt on what their character did with their freedom after. Wish. Abella, now confused and wanting to know more with the eldritch knowledge she has attained while fighting Rare, decided she wants to talk to him again, without the help of Perkle. She researches and helps the space program for a decade and becomes the first astronaut, about to meet Rare once more. Wish. Dan, still depressed, ponders to himself. If he was upset with his father-in-law for sacrificing himself and his daughter to Sulphur, then he just did much worse to win this festival. With nothing left to live for, he considers what Pocket Cat has said to him. He knows what Dan did, and he knows he's an empty slate. Why not take the offer? Dan thinks to himself. More than likely, Dan becomes the new Pocket Cat no matter what here. Karen, now knowing a bunch about the occult and the old and new gods, decides to try to tell the world about what she has seen. She has to convince the world, despite being almost unbelievable. However, having a goal in mind keeps the fear out of her mind and gives her something to focus on. <laughs> Levi, originally happy that he has cut all ties with his previous life, moves from place to place. Eventually, the memories start creeping into his mind of what he did. He never stood in one place again due to nightmares or PTSD. He never found a home. <laughs> Marina, almost happy that all of that happened, decided to settle down in the country of Valand. She moved to the capital and found a new home in the Red Light District, finding kindred spirits. However, someone had followed her from her past. This person is more than likely Samurai. What this means, however, is very confusing. Because in this ending, you had to have killed Samurai. 
So how is she alive? There's no way she could have lived through the festival. So how is she here? We don't know. Marco continues to Rondon, meeting his sister and never telling anyone about this experience. No one would even believe him if he did. He eventually started a boxing gym to help others prepare in case they're in a similar situation to him, because he had to do something to alleviate his guilt. Olivia, at first traumatized by her experiences, turned this trauma into strength and happiness. Olivia was the winner, with her disability and all. She did it. She was strong. She triumphed over all these capable people. She realized she is more than her disability and is a strong person underneath it. She felt her sister helping her along the way every step of the journey. She was now truly free. This was the one and only person that is a happy ending for, which I resonate with. Osa realizes that he has no gods and no masters now, only him. He throws Nashra's head into the lake and feels free. He starts his own temple and it rivaled a lot of others, even Almer. This time, he was in charge, with no one above him. So that's ending B. It's kind of like a bittersweet, hollow ending. However, this ending is the only ending that doesn't really change anything. I kind of like this ending the most because it isn't an extreme change. Ending A is more than likely a loss of all individuality. Sure, it's all world peace and all, but no one is getting to be their own person anymore. Ending C, which we will get to, is the exact opposite. It's complete freedom with no moral compasses anymore for anyone. However, ending B, nothing changes. I love the world I live in and I accept it flaws and all. So, this is my favorite ending. Ending C is probably the easiest to get in my opinion. Now, before you yell at me, I truly find it easier to kill everyone by the end of day 2 than to deal with Rare. But let's get into it formally. To get ending C, all you have to do is exactly what you did in ending B. However, you have to kill everyone by the end of day 2. Even if it's morning of day 3, you can no longer get this ending. So, instead of getting 8 guaranteed saves, you get 5. If you plan it out though, it really is not as hard as it seems. You really don't have to deal with any Moon Scorched people at all. Once you do that and enter the tower, Perkle will tell you what this is all really for. He is no longer a servant of the Moon God Rare. He is now a servant of the Sulphur God. And this whole festival was just to find someone worthy of being in the Cult of Sulphur. And you, particularly savage and bloodthirsty in the act of killing everyone by the end of the day too, has impressed Perkle. So much so that he will want you to join him. He will tell you about the Sulphur Cult, which you can hear more about in my video on Sulphur, which is on screen. But he will say to become a cult member of Sulphur, you have to die in a ritual. You will be reborn in the Sulphur Pits, where your humanity will now be burned away by burning Sulphur. Perkle will say you will now fight as equals. If you want to hear about the Perkle fight, go listen to ending B. But after you win, you will both die. You will be cast into the Sulphur Pits where you can see him. The Sulphur God. What this means is really unknown right now. You'll be reborn as a sulfur cultist, but that doesn't really mean anything, other than you will be able to do whatever you want without a conscious. So that's it. That's all three endings of Fear and Hunger 2. There might be more added, but as of January 2024, that's it. I really hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. I love you all.